Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the panel on the microbiota in human diseases, which is one of the most exciting fields today, I believe. And it's a recently emerging field. Twelve years ago, upon the completion of the Human Genome Project, it really opened up a wealth of information about our genes, which we're just beginning to understand. But as you know, we also all carry around with us a very rich ecosystem of microbes that vastly outnumber the cells in our body by a factor of 10, at least, and whose collective genome is at least 150 times larger than our own. We are increasingly recognizing that these microbes play a very significant role in determining human health and disease. And with data from the Human Microbiome Project and others, we're starting to delve into vast warehouses of information and begin to characterize many of these coexisting microorganisms and how they interact with our bodies. Current studies have already established some links between the microbiome and inflammatory bowel disease, and one of our panelists will speak to that, Dr. David Artis, as well as connections between the microbiome obesity and metabolic disorders, and one of our panelists, Dr. Jeffrey Gordon, is going to talk some about that. And there have even been links between disruptions of the microbiome and with anxiety, depression, and even autism, which was the subject of the last panel. And Dr. Masmanian will address that as well. Much of this research has utilized uh, mouse models, often using notobiotic or germ-free mice, uh, so that we can extrapolate results to humans. Um, but that is still a big step ahead of us, and we'll be talking about how what we've learned in animal model systems uh, can be verified and validated in the human. But these early results are obviously very intriguing. For example, one of our panelists, Jeff Gordon, recently showed that transferring microbes from an obese person into a notobiotic mouse caused them to become obese, but that if you pretreated the mice with microbiota from a lean individual, that protected against the weight gain. And that's a simplification of that study, and Jeff will say more about it, I'm sure. Conversely, transferring microbes from children suffering from malnutrition caused germ-free mice to lose about 30% of their weight in three weeks. Pretty startling result. However, when these mice were fed with a peanut butter-based supplement, whose name I now forget, but it's a wonderful supplement that's used to treat malnourished uh, children in developing countries, that reversed the loss of body weight. I think the work in the field clearly indicates that the microbiome has very important implications for understanding human metabolism. And it also provides a lot of data to suggest that the great microbial variation that exists among individuals exists both in an individual and across the population. For example, American Gut is one research project currently ongoing that explores population-level patterns by inviting members of the public to submit samples and see how their microbiomes compare to others from around the country. Thousands of people have had their microbiomes sequenced already. Other studies focus on indigenous populations in Tanzania, Venezuela, and Peru to examine the cross-cultural impact of diet and lifestyle on the microbiome. And a faculty member from our own institution, while Cornell Medicine, Dr. Chris Mason, has uh, gained some, some uh, press by swabbing subways all around New York City and doing analysis of the microbes that we are all touching all the time every time we take the tea. So this is just the beginning. Um, Knowledge in this field is going to grow, and it's going to grow in rapid bursts. And the hope is that at some point we'll be able to identify specific bacteria for specific diseases and learn how to manipulate them to uh, provide treatment for those diseases. 
It may be possible also to create communities of bacteria. And these bacteria, of course, make a lot of small molecules um, to develop new drugs. With that, all that being said, uh, let me turn to our panelists who are going to shed some further light on the subject. And uh, let me introduce them briefly, and then they're each going to come up and talk to you for about two to three minutes about uh, their specific interests. So on my left is Dr. David Artis, who's the Michael Kors Professor of Immunology and Director of the Jill Roberts Institute for Research in Inflammatory Bowel Disease at Weill Cornell Medicine. Dr. Jeffrey Gordon, who's the Robert Glazer University Professor and Director of the Center for Genome Sciences and Systems Biology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. John Hamber, who is a Distinguished Research Fellow at Beringer Ingelheim. Dr. Charles Mackay, who is the Chief Scientific Officer of Inflammation and Immunology at Pfizer. And finally, Sarkis Masmanian, who is the Lewis and Nellie Sue Professor of Microbiology at Caltech. So welcome and thank you all for being here. And with that, let me turn um, the discussion over to you, Dr. Artis. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Laurie, for the introduction and the invitation to participate in this panel. So we were asked just to say a couple of words about our general interests um, in the absence of any visual aids. So um, broadly, my lab is interested in, and the Roberts Institute at Wild Cornell Medicine is interested in understanding how the microbiota influences chronic inflammatory and metabolic diseases. As Laurie alluded to, from the uh, sequencing approaches of the last uh, decade or so, we've learned an enormous amount about how the composition of the microbiota changes um, in healthy individuals in the context of a number of diseases from asthma and allergy, particularly um, that's uh, work that's been done in pediatric populations. We know um, in the context of inflammatory bowel diseases that the composition of the microbiota changes fairly dramatically, both in pediatric very early onset IBD and also in, um, in adults with IBD. Beyond the barrier surfaces, we know that changes in the composition of the microbiota are associated with uh, arthritis, inflammatory arthritis, uh, with metabolic diseases, um, including obesity, and Jeff will probably tell us more about that. Also, uh, in the context even of um, the inflammatory response associated uh, with cancer. So, of course, one of the challenges is to understand to what extent those changes are simply biomarkers of an ongoing disease or to what extent changes in the composition of the microbiota may influence the, um, the development or the progression of these uh, complex uh, inflammatory and metabolic um, uh, phenotypes. So we're interested from a basic science perspective in understanding how the immune system has evolved to tolerate the colonization of the body's barrier surfaces by these complex communities of beneficial microbes, as you would expect, the immune system um, is constantly sampling those um, communities, but there are uh, complex and sophisticated mechanisms of tolerance in place to avoid inappropriate immune responses. We're interested in how the immune system can influence the composition of the microbiota, so we know that as the immune response develops, either in the context of infection or inflammatory diseases, that can induce distinct modules of the innate and adaptive immune system. It can influence the physiology of the barrier surfaces that changes um, the composition of these microbial communities. Reciprocally, we're interested in understanding how individual species of, uh, that make up the microbiota or consortia of species can influence the immune system. And some examples that I'm sure will come up in the discussion today are um, defined species linking Th17, pro-inflammatory T cell responses, uh, distinct communities of microbiota that can influence regulatory T cells and other mechanisms of immune regulation. And the, the hope here is that we'll be able to elucidate mechanistically at a molecular level how these complex interactions take place and, and use that information um, to therapeutically manipulate the microbiota or to mimic uh, signals derived from the microbiota to limit um, inflammation. So I'll uh, pass over to Jeff. Well, it's a bit unfair because you have... Is this on? 
because you have to listen to me for about 45 minutes after this. Um, so um, let me just give you a brief synopsis of the uh, interest of the students that I'm fortunate enough to have in the lab. Um, uh, we think of uh, the gut microbiota, which contains the largest collection of microbes in our body, tens of trillions, uh, as an organ. Um, we, we're typically, when we are um, presented with the term human developmental biology focused on human cells and human organs, we're interested in the developmental biology of this organ, which is able to transform foods into metabolic products uh, that have big effects on myriad aspects of our biology. Um, we're testing the hypothesis that the uh, nutritional and energetic value of food isn't a set of absolute terms, but is influenced and impacted by the consumer's gut microbiota, this collection of organisms. We learn often from the extremes of biology, and we're testing how food interacts with the uh, microbiota by examining children with undernutrition living in low-income countries. Undernutrition uh, isn't due to food insecurity alone. We have evidence that uh, it involves perturbation in the development of this community. And on the other end of the extreme, obesity, um, and whether there are job vacancies in the microbiota of obese individuals that need to be filled in order to rectify not only the body composition abnormalities, but the metabolic abnormalities. Um, like um, David mentioned, uh, this field is um, inherently descriptive, almost in a seductive way. Um, it's filled with hyperbole. Um, there's a need for sobriety, specifically to understand fundamental mechanisms of how these communities form, how organisms interact with one another, and how they legislate their um, interactions or dialogue with the host. Um, um, and so there are needs for fundamental um, basic science approaches, as well as the allure of translation and separating cause from effect and the generalizability of observations we make in specific subsets of humans to other humans living in different cultural um, uh, settings with different culinary uh, uh, tradition. And lastly, uh, I'd just like to emphasize um, there, there are um, uh, there's a certain degree of timeliness um, in this field, which is as ancient as microbiology itself, because the questions we'll talk about today are as old as microbiology. We're not unique. We just have uh, different technologies that we're applying. Um, this is an incredibly challenging century for humanity. I don't know how we're going to get out of this century and live peacefully together with one another. One of the major challenges is the interface between issues of sustainability and being able to feed ourselves with foods that are affordable and more nutritious. And the question is whether the gut microbiota will have a disruptive effect on our understanding of the origins of um, our nutritional status, influence our nutritional recommendations, and also operate at the nexus between agriculture, food production, and these nutritional uh, recommendations. So um, I'll end by saying that uh, you certainly are not going to dine alone for the rest of your life. You have tens of trillions of partners with you. <laughs> So uh, why um, is this on? Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, so while the pharma industry certainly is interested in the relationship between and, and contribution that the, um, the gut microbiota plays in, in disease as well as in health, um, I, I think there's three other aspects that are are, are very important to, to drug development, in particular. One has to do with drug metabolism. Um, we normally think of drug metabolism as the way in which um, drugs are eliminated or removed from um, the patient. Um, and, and we think of this mostly in terms of what the liver does in terms of phase one enzymes, such as uh, cytochrome P450s, or phase two enzymes, uh, like glucuronidation. These are all oxidated uh, events in which we m modify the, the compounds that we, we take, the drugs that we take, and, and they become eventually removed. Sometimes they're actually activated Sometimes they're inactivated by, by these events. We're now appreciating that the microbes in our gut also are keenly involved and in, in, in intimately involved in drug metabolism, but not from an oxidative point of view, but from a reduction point of view. The, the, the gut is a very anaerobic environment. 
In other words, it has no oxygen. And so it reduces compounds. And, and we now know that this route is, is actually a very important way in which drugs can either become activated or inactivated by our gut microbes. And this is a concern because what we know, is, as Dr. Gordon and, and, and others on this panel have shown, is that the, the microbiome um, between individuals varies greatly. And we don't understand a lot about what that composition is, how it changes uh, in respect to our diet or other environmental factors, how it changes with aging. And so this is a very key thing to start thinking about um, as we move into more of a personalized medicine uh, era of really thinking about the, the gut and the microbes there as personalized drug metabolizers. The second area that I think uh, should be appreciated here is that this um, microbiota that we contain uh, or carry with us throughout our entire life is an incredibly rich source of making new small molecules, very complex small molecules. The um, genetics that have gone on in terms of sequencing um, the genomes of, of this um, microbiome has shown us that there are literally hundreds of thousands of biosynthetic gene clusters that can make new molecules that we've never seen before. And this is a really exciting opportunity to actually tap into this as a new source of medicines. Drugs that we already know, like rapamycin, for example, very impressive uh, immunomodulatory agent, one that also has maybe some effects in aging, comes from one of these biosynthetic gene clusters. And this is just one example. There are hundreds of thousands of these. And so to tap into this as a, as a, a rich vein for new small molecules that could be used as, as new therapies is very exciting. And I think lastly, uh, I want to mention that this microbiome produces an incredible amount of the, uh, these small molecules that could be used as biomarkers for human health, um, it, whether it's response to a drug itself or just to dictate um, our, our overall health. One could imagine a day in which we all have smart toilets, right? Don't laugh. Um, in which these, th these devices are actually telling us on a, on a real-time basis whether we need to change our diet, maybe get more exercise, or how we're actually responding to a drug. And this could be done on something as simple as a smartphone. And the amount of data, if you can start thinking about this, that could be generated with such a device in, in a population, is, is, it could potentially be massive. Um, but this could be a really interesting area to, to think about um, you know, markers of, of how we're doing in health. It turns out that this idea is not such a new idea. Um, Chinese emperors, as you may or may not know, um, had an individual which would assess the emperor's stool and tell the emperor whether uh, they needed to change their diet, maybe get more exercise, uh, or if they're actually in, in good health. So this is an old idea, but I think modern technology could really revolutionize this. So with, uh, with that thought, I'll, 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 I'll turn it over <laughs> to Charles. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've had a long-term interest in how nutrition can affect the immune system. And I think we all appreciate that certain diseases like asthma, food allergies, uh, fatty liver disease, you know, many so-called Western lifestyle diseases have just exploded in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And the prevailing hypothesis for that has been the hygiene hypothesis, which is that, that we're too clean, that um, that somehow skews the immune system in the wrong way, uh, and that leads to these sort of allergic responses and even autoimmune diseases. So I think we've just seen now a much more compelling, I think, explanation, and that's to do with how nutrition affects the gut microbiome that then produces factors that are responsible for gut homeostasis and the regulation of inflammatory diseases, not, not just in the gut, but throughout the body, uh, in the airways and so forth. So, so we sought to sort of really look for this alternative to the hygiene hypothesis. And we got into this field because we found a receptor called GPR43 that when we knocked it out gave us this amazing phenotype in gut uh, IBD, and sorry, in mouse IBD mo uh, mo uh, models. Um, since the discovery of that receptor, in fact, there's a whole 
range of receptors, these so-called metabolite sensing receptors, that are doing the same thing. They're regulating gut homeostasis, gut integrity, immune responses um, by recognizing metabolites, bacterial metabolites, also other just uh, natural metabolites. And so all of the things that you consider healthy, like dietary fiber, are in fact producing a metabolite, short-chain fatty acids that binds these receptors, or omega-3 fatty acids, uh, tryptophan metabolites, all these so-called healthy uh, food metabolites and now have sensors that do good things in the gut. And so we've sought to understand uh, how, how all of these receptors and metabolites work. It's not just metabolite sensors. There's other mechanisms, which you'll hear on a little bit uh, after me, but there's the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which is incredibly important, a transcription factor, um, uh, and, and then there's also the histone deacetylase, which short-chain fatty acids affect through imprinting. Um, so collectively, these somehow mediate gut health and, and indeed peripheral health. Um, let me tell you something that I think is one of the most exciting new fields that, that we just got into in my academic lab, and that was the effect of metabolites, including bacterial metabolites, not in the adult, but in utero in the developing fetus. So in fact, these metabolites can be produced in the gut, cross the placenta, and then have epigenetic effects, imprinting. And so there's this major theory called the developmental origin of disease that in fact things like obesity, cardiovascular disease, and we showed asthma, and I would also argue type 1 diabetes, are in fact set in train in utero and depend on your mother's microbiota and her diet. And so I think that's an incredibly new frontier in this, in this whole field. So um, at Pfizer, we're, we're not a probiotic company. We want to try and be in this space and try and have the best strategy. I think the logical way forward for pharmaceutical companies is to learn from the microbiota, learn the pathways that they use for immune regulation and gut health and try and replicate that with you know, typical small molecule drugs. I think another incredibly uh, productive approach will be to use specialized, sophisticated diets that will drive the microbiota in the right direction. Rather than relying on a, the ingestion of the right microbes, I think it's a much, a much more powerful approach. Um, and of course, the final thing I'd like to say is that I think there's enormous potential in combining nutrition, these nutritional approaches, either basic or sophisticated, with pharmaceuticals so you get the best of both worlds. You get like the uh, fantastic effects through several mechanisms, like butyrate operates through several mechanisms that are all great, the healthy, and then combine that perhaps with like your typical small molecule to a to a drug target and put the two together and you've got, I think, something that's really going to have an effect in things like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or even peripheral inflammatory diseases. Um, well, first I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for the opportunity to be on this distinguished panel and I, I want to echo uh, Charles's comments on the hygiene hypothesis because it's really how we started our work in trying to understand how specific organisms modulate the immune system in beneficial ways. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that everyone in this room, um, at least most of the people in this room, were brought up to, to think that gut micro or microbes are these insidious little creatures that want to cause disease, the bacteria and viruses, all they want to do is make us sick. I, I certainly didn't. I received my, my graduate work in microbial pathogenesis. But I think that what, what's happened is that based on a, a, what is a small number of organisms that we associate with, that we've changed medical practice and, and um, scientific research, at least up until about a decade ago. And we've targeted organisms in sometimes in broad and nonspecific ways, such as antibiotics or vaccination hygiene as well. And I think in these efforts that they've been quite successful in eradicating and controlling infectious disease, I think that they've done in some ways a potential disservice to society because 
in our efforts to distance ourselves from pathogenic organisms. We've also distanced ourselves from potentially beneficial organisms. And in fact, many of the organisms, many of the microbes that we associate with are likely beneficial, if not benign. And we've dropped a nuclear bomb on them, if you will, with antibiotics. And so a few years ago, um, more like a decade ago, we, we set out to identify those good organisms and, and those organisms that may modulate the immune system because of this advance, as Charles mentioned, an increase in inflammatory diseases, allergic diseases, even autoimmune diseases, which may be a consequence of targeting the good organisms. And so I think that a potential uh, hypothesis is that the absence of specific bacteria may be a risk factor for disease. And if you can identify those organisms, then perhaps you can develop drugs from bugs, novel, novel therapeutics based on, on beneficial organisms. And so in our laboratory, we've uh, identified particular organisms and perhaps of interest to the pharmaceutical industry, molecules from those organisms, because live therapeutics are, I think, um, a little bit down the road, but molecules are something that we can all wrap our minds around in, in terms of drug development. And we've identified organisms um, that produce these molecules that drive anti-inflammatory or protective suppressive immune responses, which are protective against inflammatory diseases. And so one can think about taking a pill with a bacteria or more likely a bacterial molecule that induces regulatory T cells that David mentioned, these anti-inflammatory cells, which are essentially the brakes on the immune system, which would then curtail uncontrolled inflammation or autoimmunity. And it's also quite interesting to, to think that the receptor for this one particular molecule that we've been studying is the same receptor that, that, that our immune system uses to, <clears throat> excuse me, our immune system uses to identify pathogens. And so I think that the, the wiring and the circuitry is very similar. It's just that these beneficial organisms have learned to tickle the receptors in a way that induces a, a protective response as, as opposed to a, a, an inflammatory response that a pathogen will. And more recently, we, we've asked the question of do these principles that we've identified, that, meaning the field has identified, um, that, in our, that where microbes interact with the immune system, do these principles apply to other systems in the body, such as the nervous system? And we've become quite interested in the gut-brain axis, and this is, this is um, an area that's been under research for, for about a century more intensely in the, in the past few years. Can we access the central nervous system? Can we potentially access the brain and neurological functions by targeting the gut? And once again, we and others have made, I think, pretty, pretty good but still, still uh, very early strides in trying to understand how microbes activate the enteric uh, nervous system or even the immune response in the gut and how this translates into effects in, in uh, behavior, in uh, mood, emotion, potentially even neurodegeneration. And so I think that the gut-brain axis and the effects on the neurological system are potentially a new frontier for the microbiome. Great. Thank you all. I think we've all gotten a sense of the enormous implications of this field already for human disease. Now, the way I, th I thought we'd conduct this panel is to make it as interactive as possible. So I'm going to start out by asking our panelists a few questions, but I encourage the audience to please raise your hands and uh, ask them questions yourself. But let's start out with um, a general question. So we know that we've already achieved some proof of principle yeah. in terms of treating human disease with microbiota. And that is in the setting of Clostridium difficile, an infection uh, which is due to overgrowth of C. difficile in the intestine, primarily of elderly patients who have been treated with antibiotics in the hospital. And that this, uh, this infection can be cured by a fecal transplant. So let me, let me start with you, Jeff. Um, tell us a little bit about the current knowledge of the composition of the micro, microbiota, some general thoughts about the structure of microbial communities, factors that can influence the sustainability um, and stability of this huge collection of microbes that uh, is controlling our lives. That's a great question, but a very big question for uh, a very large number of organisms. Um, um, uh, let me be gut-centric and say that um, this society of microbes um, 
um, in adults <coughs> is dominated by members of the domain of life known as bacteria, although all three domains of life are represented uh, in their viruses, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Um, two, um, as you look around the globe and sample the microbiota from adults representing different cultural traditions and um, uh, different culinary traditions, we see we see that there's been a simplification of diversity um, associated with uh, a Western lifestyle. So the number, it's not so much the absolute number of actors, but the diversity of actors in the microbial community um, have been reduced. And that probably has an important implication uh, for the resiliency of the system as it recovers from various perturbations. There are many different versions of a particular bacterial species that are represented in our gut microbiota. As if um, bets weren't placed on just one type of strain of a bacterial species that we have different versions to respond to different conditions. Um, um, the, the gut um, selects um, certain types of bacteria depending upon what features they have encoded in their genome. The remarkable thing is, although you heard there is interpersonal diversity in who's there in the microbial community, these different uh, assemblages of species share common genes. So we converge onto more common or uh, similar functional states in our gut microbiota in, in health. And the last thing I'll say in answer to your question is that, um, and I'll talk about this in a, in a little bit. Um, is there a common route to assembling this community? Uh, and what are the sources of the organisms that um, eventually inhabit our gut? And what we're looking, um, as we look around the world, um, for building blocks, we're seeing an orderly pattern of um, succession or assembly of the microbiota involving similar actors, as if part of the evolution of humans uh, involved um, the development of a set of rules that allowed certain organisms to pioneer their establishment within the microbiota and then others to follow. And this pattern of succession shared across humans I think is very important in the following sense. Building a healthy microbiota um, is critical for healthy growth and the types of microbiota that we assemble in our guts have important uh, implications durable implications for our physiologic state, our metabolic state, our immunological state. So learning how to construct healthy microbiota, being good microbial farmers, preserving our microbial resources is very, very important. Think bacteria, other domains of life, there are viruses there, orderly assembly. Um, what we're doing with globalization is not good to our microbiota. So let's turn to a specific disease, I think. Um, let me ask you, David, and any other members of the panel uh, to talk to us a little bit about the changes in the microbiota that um, are associated with chronic inflammatory diseases, in particular uh, inflammatory bowel disease. This is a field in which I have special interest because several years ago we were able to create a mouse model of ulcerative colitis that looked a lot like the human model. And uh, Dr. Wendy Garrett uh, in the laboratory was able to identify two species uh, in the gut that seem to confer this colitogenic phenotype. But the field has certainly moved on since then. And uh, let me ask you, David, to make some comments about what we know about the organisms that can affect uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Thanks, Laurie. So in many ways, as I think most of this audience will be aware, uh, the inflammatory bowel diseases have really um, provided a roadmap for our early understanding of the composition of the microbiota and how it changes in a, in a complex disease like Crohn's or UC or very early onset IBD in pediatric patients. We know, as I mentioned from sequencing approaches, that there are uh, shifts in the composition of the microbiota, the higher phylogenetic levels, those are um, fairly consistent across um, patients, an imbalance uh, 
for those of you who remember Microbiology 101, an imbalance in the bacteroides versus um, members of the firmicutes. From preclinical models, one can certainly mimic those um, changes associated with disease. So one can deliberately manipulate uh, the microbiota of mice and change their susceptibility or resistance to mouse models of intestinal inflammation uh, and tissue repair. From those mouse models, well, obviously we can go even deeper. Um, there are individual organisms that can be pro-inflammatory. Um, uh, one uh, called SFB, which has been studied extensively, particularly across the street at NYU by Dan Lippmann and colleagues. Um, there are other individual organisms and groups of organisms that can limit inflammation, um, members of the Clostridia in particular, um, uh, and, and those associations also appear to hold true in, uh, in human uh, disease studies as well. What I think um, perhaps most important to think about is how can we deliberately uh, manipulate the microbiota from a therapeutic perspective. This has been alluded to and I think will be a central theme of what we talk about. Is it one could certainly think about changing the diet, which we know will change the composition of the microbiota, so thinking of healthy diets that will promote healthy microbes. The other approach, um, equally uh, important perhaps, is to think about identifying the, the molecules that are secreted by the microbiota, whether those are short-chain fatty acids or whether they're polysaccharides or other bioactive molecules that one could um, develop mimics from. And, uh, and use those therapeutically. And I think um, those are the areas that many, many labs are taking. And I think this is, goes well beyond, of course, IBD, where a lot of this work began, but you already heard from the panel that this is, um, this, these approaches are relevant to many of the chronic inflammatory diseases of, of um, industrialized uh, countries right now. What is the status of clinical trials uh, for fecal transplants in inflammatory bowel disease? Um, I'll say something perhaps and then I'll pass it over. Uh, so of, as you mentioned, um, fecal transplants and C. diff colitis happen every day and uh, some of them are under very controlled conditions and some of them are not so controlled. Um, but in the context of inflammatory bowel diseases, a number of uh, very small studies have recently been published but there are the ongoing trials here in uh, at our own institution at Wellcanal. Uh, and UC patients. Um, and I think uh, the, uh, there were a couple of um, reports just recently. Um, they were very small numbers of patients, but there were variable um, reports of efficacy. And I don't know if maybe John or Charles, if you guys want to comment on, on that. Yeah, um, certainly um, in the area of, of looking at patients that get bone marrow transplants, um, there's some really interesting trials going on right now at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, with Eric Pamer, in which he's shown that uh, a patient's own fetal microbiome, um, if harvested before they go through a regimen before bone marrow transplant, which would involve um, chemotherapy, radiation, as well as extensive antibiotic use, which is, uh, like Charles mentions, is literally a, a nuclear weapon that wipes out uh, your entire microbiome. We all carry, most of us carry C. difficile spores in us, and it's the lack of these good microbes that allow uh, other microbes to take over in the gut and produce metabolites that actually trigger both the sporulation of C. difficile as well as its growth and production of the toxins that ultimately would kill a patient getting a bone marrow transplant. And so this, this simple idea of taking out a patient's own fecal microbiome or microbiota and then transplanting it back into the patient before they get a bone marrow transplant is starting to show some efficacy in terms of what the survivability of those patients post bone marrow transplant. So that's just one example. I think there are other trials going on right now uh, in other disease areas, especially in, in the IBD space, uh, but I think it's too early to comment on whether these are having any effect or not. Yeah. 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 Yeah, look, um, I, I don't think many of these trials have read out, but I just hear that everybody is experimenting with fecal transplantation from, from not just IBD, but virtually, uh, virtually any inflammatory disease. These, everyone's jumping on this. I suppose my, which I think is probably an interesting thing, um, my perspective is that one, fecal transplantation has really validated 
I mean, it's the ultimate probiotic. It's just incredibly crude. And I think a challenge will be to make it less crude and something, something more defined and, 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 and logical and rational. And so that's why, um, that's what I think is why I like the fecal transplant approach. I mean, at least it's been good for our field. But um, let's see what happens in the next year or two of the many trials, I think, that are gone, ongoing around the world. Jeff. Yeah, I, I um, think um, transplants are an interesting um, test of certain biological principles. It's really a shame uh, that there aren't more uniform protocols to characterize the samples that are being used from the donor for these transplants. So-called microbial source tracking to determine whether you insert, i.e. invade the recipient's microbiota with donor uh, species and how durable the um, engraftment is. Um, one of the major challenges in the field is to uh, assess not only the short-term effects of reconfiguring the structure and function of the microbiota, but the long-term effects. So is an immediate reconfiguration beneficial, but how about the long-term consequences for physiology, immunity, metabolism? Um, and I think like much in this field, there's a tremendous allure to do these experiments, although fecal transplants aren't new. Um, I, I think a cautionary tale is, is really um, a cautionary note is really, really important until we get, as Charles said, to synthetic communities, defined consortia, sequenced microbes um, that are viewed as drugs, tested as drugs, um, and uh, regulated as drugs. Yeah, just to comment on that a little further, um, certainly in the drug field, we, we look at potency testing as critical to understanding dose. This is not doable right now with fecal transplants. We don't even know what the good benefits are, so it's impossible to do sort of potency testing. So you can't actually determine um, what a dose might be or how frequently you might need to give it or how long-lasting that, that effect is. I don't think we know anything about after a trans fecal transplant, how long that uh, new microbiome, if you will, stays established in that, in that patient. So it's a, it's a really big issue right now. Uh, and I think this notion of durability of the microbiome that, that, that was just mentioned is critical. Uh, so the success in um, fecal transplants for C. difficile is mainly in reoccurring C. diff infections. And these are patients who have taken multiple doses of antibiotics over many, many years. And they have essentially wiped out their, their microbiomes. And it might be the same in, in, in transplant patients. And so these are, these are individuals who essentially have an open niche for the fecal transplants to, to now invade or, or, or be delivered to and then, and then maintain. So there, we, we all um, benefit from a phenomenon called colonization resistance, where we have organisms in our intestine that keep potentially bad organisms out, and this is you know, a roadblock to fecal transplants. So I think the success story, once again, in C. diff, where you know, the success rates are over 90%, how many drugs actually have 90% efficacy, right? I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable. I, I, I think the jury's still out on other indications besides C. diff and perhaps bone marrow transplant. So from your comment, I would, I'm inferring that you'd have to eat gallons and gallons of probiotic yogurt yes. in order to make any impact on your microbiota. Depends on how you define probiotic, I guess, right? So, so the commercially available organisms, many of them were isolated many, many decades ago for quite arbitrary non-biological reasons. And, and so if, you, if probiotics are what you're referring to as next generation, the, the organisms that are being developed based on, on rigorous experimentation, then, then perhaps you know, quantity may be one way of doing it. Not that I'm advocating for this next approach, but maybe an antibiotic treatment prior to to the probiotic or the fecal transplant may have efficacy, or just understanding how the, the beneficial organisms can gain a foothold. If we understand how these organisms can colonize and really understand the biogeography of the gut, then maybe we can engineer, and I know, you know GMOs are, are a touch subject, maybe we can engineer organisms that, that can be directed and can colonize and can overcome colonization resistance. So this strikes me as, um, in some ways, the next the next application of precision medicine because each individual has a different microbiome and the microbiome of your skin or your genital tract or your intestine is, differs from individual to individual and among individuals, right? So how on earth are we going to be able to harness the right bacterium for each individual with a specific 
disease? I, I don't think it's going to be as bad as you portray, or maybe you didn't mean to imply it. Uh, I, I, no, I no, do, just the I, challenges. I, I do think that uh, understanding uh, what Sarkis was saying, niche, or the job filled by organisms in these complex communities is critical. And one of the, Roy last night talked about the importance of balancing fundamental research with applied research. So um, there are tools that are coming online to um, do whole genome transposon mutagenesis to actually find the genetic underpinnings of fitness in different community contexts. Um, and I think that um, tools to develop uh, understanding of which job vacancies exist in a particular person's microbiota is critical. The other thing is that there's a lot of different versions or strains of given species. So perhaps one of the most intimidating jobs um, of people who have aspirations to do a form of regenerative medicine involving microbial cells rather than human cells is to uh, choose which strains to administer of a particular species level taxon, that's the jargon. Um, and whether we're going to have to um, develop consortia of different strains that represent a species to fill the job is going to be an important question. There's a lot of IP pressure to do so, by the way, because you can't patent uh, live organisms. You might be able to patent organisms that have unexpected or unanticipated functional features if combined. Um, you also need the delivery systems to take organisms who hate oxygen enough so that if you write the word oxygen on a sheet of paper and show it to the organism, it'll die. Uh, so the delivery method, we the first um, um, set of talks this morning, uh, really have to be applied encapsulation technology for these live organisms if we are to think about that um, as a follow-on to fecal transplants and the rudimentary nature of those transplants. So when I think about um, the uh, sites where the microbiota accumulates, I think of, of um, orifices of various sorts. Um, and at all of these orifices, particularly in the intestine, the skin, well, in all of them really, we have one barrier or one helper, and that's the immune system. And the immune system's gotten to be quite complicated in terms of the number and kind of cells that interact with the microbiota and with the epithelium. And I think it would be useful for this audience if uh, several of you would talk a little bit about the key immune cells and what we know about their activities in controlling microbiota and protecting barriers, epithelial barriers. David, why don't you uh, begin? I can start. It's another big topic for uh, Just give us a, a big, brief capsule you know, of the key cells. Um, so I think in terms of, uh, again, the gut is probably best studied, but these modules of the immune response that play an important role in regulating the microbiota are fairly conserved. For, so for, in, 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 for example, in, in the innate immune system, we know that macrophages, um, innate lymphoid cells, neutrophils are important in regulating expression of antimicrobial peptides and uh, mucins and so forth that um, provide some kind of chemical barrier uh, to the microbiota and influence its composition. Within the adaptive immune system, of course, Th17 cells and, and, and other helper T cell populations play an important role in influencing um, uh, the colonization by the microbiota. And of course, antibodies like secretory IgA is uh, we make uh, grams and grams of IgA every day in the intestine, which is secreted into the lumen and can influence um, the microbiota as well. I'm, and I may have missed some, some of the panel's other favorite immune cells or immune pathways. You know, Charles, I, do you want I, that? Look, I, I really think that the separation of yourself with your environment through the you know, GI tract is one of the most fundamental millions and millions of years old problems we have because we have to separate food and bacteria from from ourselves and infection and so I think that the, these mechanisms go back you know millennia uh, millions and millions of years um, to me the two most interesting is the actual epithelial barrier itself which has to be tight and I think many of these Western lifestyle diseases are actually a result of a leaky gut 
and the passage of toxins and bacteria themselves out of the gut into the blood and tissues. So the epithelial cell for sure is incredibly important and now we understand the mechanisms whereby metabolites make the gut tight, uh, which I won't go into because it's very complex. The other, the other critical cell in the gut for um, what we call immune or gut homeostasis is the T regulatory cell because that's a tolerant cell and it ensures that you don't make an inappropriate response to food antigens or even to bacteria themselves. And so the metabolites, particularly butyrate, are incredibly important to promote these tolerogenic cells that dampen down the immune response so we're not having a raging response to everything that's going on. And I think that's what happens in inflammatory bowel diseases. We, for some reason, these cells are dysregulated or not promoted and you get these inappropriate responses. And so I think all the major cell types have been, have been named, and maybe David's favorite ILCs. He was modest enough not to mention his own groundbreaking work in eight lymphoid cells. But, but maybe I can extend the question um, more conceptually and really sort of convey this notion that it's a partnership between the microbiota and the immune system that, that really regulates health. And so we know mostly from animal studies that there are entire cell types in the gut that are missing in animals that don't have gut microbes. So these gut microbes are driving differentiation of, of, of the immune system. In fact, they, they, they drive home, uh, hematopoiesis and the development of entire immune cells. There, there's a large body of work that shows that immune cells that may be there may be reduced in numbers in germ-free animals, or that gut, cells, uh, gut immune cells that are present are reduced in functions. They're not making specific molecules or expressing specific receptors in the absence of, of, of gut microbes. And so it's really the, the microbiome that's educating the immune system to fulfill its full activity. And the reason why it's a partnership is that the same immune system then feeds back on the microbiota, re reconfigures the microbiota's composition, and perhaps even keeps, and likely even keeps the microbiota from invading across the epithelial barrier, which then would cause, obviously, pretty deleterious effects. And so I think that, that one can look at the immune cells, but we also have to think about the partnership between these immune cells and, and, and our microbes. Jeff, Sorry, uh, to, can I... Um, Sorry. Uh, Jeff, then, <laughs> then you, John. Can I add uh, one... Uh, neglected actor in this uh, drama of how to separate ourselves from um, these vast collections of microbes, um, mucus. So um, mucus, uh, I know it's a slimy subject, um, <laughs> and of course, uh, of course um, one of the wonderful things about this field is it offers the opportunity to rescue from certain extinction uh, an endangered scientific species glycobiologists. Um, so mucus um, is really important, not only for the physical barrier it offers, but also as a way for organisms to embed themselves and prevent washout from the gut, which is a bioreactor, but also more profoundly from the question that Lori asked me earlier, which is, um, what is the structure of the microbiota? So think about um, the centropic or nutrient or metabolic sharing relationships between organisms. How do organisms get close enough to one another to exchange their metabolic products? Um, you have diffusion, the great enemy. So mucus offers an opportunity for organisms to get close enough to one another to communicate with one another metabolically. Understanding how organisms um, come close um, it is really, I think, a fundamental question in this field and offers a number of therapeutic opportunities because you might be able to create smart platforms for bringing organisms together intentionally so that they can do the sort of novel chemistry that's so wondrous for those of us who study these systems. So to, to just take that perspective a little further on mucus because it's really important. Um, and, and getting back to your question about the niche, um, the mucus itself can serve as a, a nutritional source for certain microbes. So it can actually provide the types of um, nutrients and environment that, that certain microbes would need to, to establish a niche. And, and we already know that there are certain microbes that can live in the mucus and others that can't. Um, and, and a, a second point on that is it's the, the epithelial cells, this single cell layer that forms this barrier that actually makes the mucus. And we, we also know from these germ-free mice is that their epithelial barrier is actually not developed. 
And so the microbes themselves are actually driving the process of creating and generating mucus as well as forming this very tight junction. So this, this is a very dynamic dialogue that they're having with us, and I don't think we understand exactly what's going on, except that, the, the, that chemistry really is the lexicon of this language, and, and, and it's really going to be getting into the chemistry that's really critical. Can I just add yes, one thing? So I think in addition to everything that you've heard, there, there's, there's two words to think about, I think, in the context of this dialogue between the immune system and the microbiota. One is the dynamic nature, and the second is sophistication. So from preclinical models, whether in flies or in mice or fish, we know that if you take out any single immune pathway of the ones you've mentioned, maybe 10 or 15 in the last few minutes, there's not the same change in the microbiota. Taking out any one pathway will selectively change the composition of the microbiota. So I think this gives us some indication of how sophisticated this coevolution um, actually is. I haven't seen any questions from the audience yet, so please be thinking. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I, I want to turn it over to the audience to participate. Um, Sarkis, I wanted to ask you a question because uh, the previous panel, of course, focused on autism and the frequency of autism in children is breathtaking. Um, you've published some very interesting work on a possible role for the microbiota in autism. Could you share with us the key take-home messages from that work? Yeah, so, so a few years ago, in collaboration with the late Paul Patterson, we, we initiated on, on this notion that if microbes were co-opting the immune system in ways that we've already described, could, could those same principles once again translate to the nervous system? And, and a few keys at that time, and this was once again, you know, you know a few years ago before many of the, the current research in autism had pointed in this direction, uh, so a few keys to us, or at least clues, were the fact that 70% of our peripheral neurons are in our gut, and that's quite remarkable, right? So if you think about your skin and your internal organs and all the other places that our brain controls outside of the central nervous system, it's dedicated a lot of resources to the, to the intestine. And what this may tell us is that bacteria have a direct conduit from the enteric nervous system through the vagus nerve into the brain. Uh, and a second clue of why we started looking at the microbiome was uh, this notion that in autism was that these notion that, that these children ha with autism have leaky gut, and so there's a high proportion of, of children, close to 70 percent of them, which have defects in the in the barrier, and so showing that there's gastrointestinal defects or knowing that there were gastrointestinal defects as well as a possibility that microbes can access the central nervous system, we asked in mouse models whether or not gut, gut, gut microbes impacted uh, autistic behavior. And what we showed was that much like the, the published literature in humans, that, that mice with features of autism had dysbiosis, had changes in their microbiomes, very characteristic shifts in their microbiomes. And in addition to that, that they had immune uh, activity or, or upregulation of the immune system, as well as leaky gut. And so this, this clued us into this notion that perhaps you know, what's happening in the gastrointestinal tract was affecting, was affecting behavior. And through a series of, of, of uh, studies, what we showed is that there are particular metabolites, and, and this concept has come up over and over again, particular metabolites, microbial molecules, which were being produced in the mice with autism-like behaviors that were getting across the barrier, getting across the leaky gut, into the circulation, and perhaps even into the brain. So there's research from other, other investigators which has shown that germ-free animals have not just leakiness of the gut, but leakiness of the blood-brain blood barrier. So the microbiome is actually controlling the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. And so what, what we showed was that these, these neuroactive, perhaps even neurotoxic gut microbes were impacting behavior in a negative way. And then ultimately what we also demonstrated is that by targeting specific bacteria to the gut, one can change this profile, both restore the dysbiosis, both restore the, the changes in the microbiome, as well as repair the leaky gut, which I think are the two inciting events that are happening in the intestine which may lead to these downstream consequences. And so we've also heard for a role for the environment in, in autism, and uh, I'll leave you with a provocative hypothesis that perhaps at least in a subset of autistic children, maybe the, 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 the cause of their behaviors are defects in the gut and not in the brain. 
And of course, this is, this is very bold and, and unproven, but if that's true, then one can imagine targeting drugs to the intestine as opposed to the brain, which I, I imagine is much easier. John, so, a, 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 an additional comment on that. There are other CNS disorders, like schizophrenia, that are also um, linked to the gut. There's been a recent study in which um, around three or 300 or so patients that had schizophrenia upon autopsy, greater than 90% of them had colitis. And that was totally unexpected, but what is colitis doing in, in patients with schizophrenia? And is it causative or effect? We have no idea, but that comorbid morbidity is just absolutely striking. So and this notion, uh, yeah, just, just a fi final comment, this notion of leaky gut, and Charles already mentioned this has been shown in, in, in schizophrenia, in autism, in multiple sclerosis, in Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. And so I think there is this notion that there may be GI involvement. So uh, I don't want to suggest causality here, but at least some involvement of, uh, of the gut. So we haven't talked yet about uh, transmissibility and, oh, sorry, there's a question out there. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, uh, I'm Neil Chowdhury from Cincinnati, and I have a question. Your microphone is off. Just <laughs> 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 so speak very loudly, and what? I can repeat the question. What? Oh, is, is on the other side? Diseases. With chronic diseases are releasing certain antibiotics and chemicals to kill the helpful bacteria or other bugs. Okay, good question. Who would like to address that? Maybe you, John? Clearly we don't know. Uh, so I, I think this is a really interesting idea and I think this, again, back to this idea that there are now hundreds of thousands of these biosynthetic gene clusters that could make complex antibiotic type molecules. I think really gets to the po possibility that the, the microbes are certainly competing amongst themselves and maybe this is the chemical warfare that they're using to do that. So it, it, it's possible, but I'd, I don't know of any examples. You know, uh, Laura Hooper at the University of uh, UT Southwestern, University of Texas Southwestern, um, has done elegant work showing that there's a particular cell type in the gut epithelium, um, um, the PANA cell, um, that's part of innate immunity. And the way it works is to release antimicrobial peptides. Now, good fences, as she says, makes good neighbors. And this is part of the normal way of creating a functional barrier. But you can imagine that the repertoire of these uh, antimicrobial peptides um, might be perturbed in certain disease states, or a deficiency in these antimicrobial peptides would result in a change in the configuration of a microbiota that would create a disease-promoting community. And I, I would just add, I, I think in the context of inflammatory disease, whether psoriasis or, or IBD, that that ongoing immune response is very likely to be changing the composition of the microbiota, potentially limiting the outgrowth of beneficial microbes uh, and allowing um, a bloom of, of bad bugs, if you like. So one could almost envision this um, feedback loop um, making the situation worse in the context of inflammation. Is a question there? Hi, I'm there's another question here. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Tavita. I'm a small molecule chemist based at Mount Sinai. Uh, I think it's a really interesting topic of microbiota. I'm just wondering about the energy that they need to, uh, to exist. So how would diet uh, impact that? So a northern diet of red meat, grains, potatoes, root vegetables versus a Mediterranean diet of grains and olive oil versus, say, an Asian or Japanese diet of soy and fish oil, perhaps. How does that impact uh, the microbiota? Jeff, I think you're going to talk about that in, in a few minutes, yes? Yeah, uh, but your point is a very good one because most of the measurements that are done on the microbiota is to look at the relative abundance of different organisms. What people haven't thought about is the thermodynamics that you're talking about. So what is the, in the parlance of, this, of the people who are working, what is the primary productivity of the system? What's the microbial biomass? What's the cost in terms of energy consumption versus partitioning to the host? And there are poor measurements currently in determining, to be able to determine the absolute number of microbes in a particular community. 
but your question is a very pertinent one, and, and I'll, I'll get back to that a little bit when I talk about undernutrition in children. Which is going to be in about one minute. So <laughs> I've got signs that we uh, need to end the panel. I know everybody has a lot more questions, including me. Our speakers will be around, and so please feel free to come up to them and uh, ask them your questions. And thank you all so much for a terrific uh, session.